Um, I'm going to speak about an uh, important topic in orthopedic surgery, limb lengthening. Limb lengthening. Uh, we're going to go through uh, history, evolution, complications, and current concepts. It starts with Codivella from Italy, who started uh, doing bone lengthening through skeletal traction, doing an osteotomy and skeletal traction. Then Abbott started to use unilateral fixator. The real breakthrough of bone lengthening was with the advent of Elizarov method or Elizarov external fixator. My history with Elizarov started in 1983. 1983, where uh, Professor Gelal Kazem, he was the chairman of the orthopedic department, Benha University Hospital, brought uh, Elizarov external fixator from Russia to Egypt, and we've been using it at the time, which is about 37 years ago when I was a resident. And we've started to do many cases of trauma, bone lengthening, bone transport since that date. So our experience with Elizarov started 37 years ago. This presentation is based on uh, my 37 years experience. I was doing thousands of cases by external fixation. Bone lengthening, bone lengthening in for cosmetic lengthening, or lengthening in congenital deformities, post-traumatic deformities, poliomyelitis, and other indications. You will find all that in, uh, in my paper presented in the Journal of Orthopedics and uh, Traumatology 2020 this year, which was published about one month ago. Egyptian history, you know, Egyptian, Egyptians have long, long history. And in this history, there was a um, description of the short people and dwarfs. And they have special uh, positions in Egyptian history. So many of the divine protectors in their pantheon were deformed, based and the protector of the Nile, happy. Society's attitude to the deformity and society's attitude to the short stature and or face, there was no discrimination. Thousands of years ago, Egyptians were treating the dwarfs and short people normally. You see in this picture, taken during dancing in the temples, all the dancers were tall, except one of them, very short one, or dwarf. Sneb, he was a very important man, very rich man in the pharaonic time. And he had many um, uh, important positions. He was married to a normal length, a tall girl, and he had children, normal children with them. The ordinary people or chondroplastic people at the time were doing normal jobs. Butchers, musicians, as you see here, they were not treated as different people. They were treated normally. What's the aim of, bone, of limb lengthening? It's um, a correction of the limb length inequality. If we have shortening for one limb, if we have two, less than two centimeters, usually we do nothing. From two to four, this is the gray centimeter, this is the gray zone. Perhaps we can lengthen the patient. But after four centimeters, usually we have problems, functional problems, and we have to do limb lengthening. Also, we are seeking for functional improvement in such cases. The third one, the third indication is cosmetic lengthening. We do cosmetic lengthening. We don't differentiate between cosmetic lengthening and lengthening for other conditions because some people are really short and they need to have lengthening. And if you look to this picture, this patient with severe shortening of the left lower limb and deformity 
and the full rotation, the heel in front and the forefoot behind. So you have severe deformity, severe shortening. It's about 12 centimeters shortening in this child. What we do, we do lengthening as you see here and we correct the limb length discrepancy gradually. Then we derotate the foot. It looks like derotation or lengthening by derotation to correct the deformity. So in such a case, the aim of bone lengthening is not just correction of the deformity or correction of the shortening, actually it's changing lives. And this picture again, with radial club hand, we lengthened the forearm of the patient about 115% of the original length. This is changing lives. Again, this patient was traumatic crushed amputation of the foot, which had been treated by shortening and replantation. And you had 22 centimeters shortening. We lengthened for 22 centimeters, about more than 100% of the original length. It's actually changing lives. The biology of limb lengthening, the general biologic law of tension stress. All the biology the re of recent limb lengthening are based on Elizarov biologic law of tension stress. Whatever you do, whatever the instrument you use, whatever you use XFIX, you use computer assisted, external fixator, unilateral fixator, lengthening nails, whatever the instrument you use, all are based on the law of tension stress, which is the biologic law invented by Elizarov. What's the law of tension stress? Gradual traction on living tissues creates stresses that can stimulate and maintain the regeneration of active growth of certain tissues. So with adequate blood supply, steady gradual traction of the tissues activates proliferative and biosynthetic functions. The regeneration develops along the axis of the applied traction. So the regenerate is de develops along the axis of the applied traction. Cortocotomy. There's argument whether to do cortocotomy or osteotomy. We are not going through this argument, but usually we do cortocotomy. Experimental studies revealed the importance of soft tissue preservation during corticotomy and fixator stability. And the osteogenic power in the regeneration area depends upon the degree of bone marrow damage, periosteum and the nutrient vessels. We always do corticotomy from a small incision and then we go through the cord medial cortex and lateral cortex and we do derotation of the fragments to get closed corticotomy posteriorly. So we keep the blood supply, we keep the soft tissues. And this is the real merit of the advances of bone lengthening, the biology, not the instrument you use. We have three stages of the biology, three stages of bone lengthening. First, the latency phase. After corticotomy, we wait for about five to 10 days. Why? because we want to do healing of the soft tissue bone care. Then distraction or gradual distraction. The distraction is the rate one millimeter per day in general, but we increase the rate or decrease the rate according to the regenerate formation. If you have good regenerate, we continue in such a way. We have profuse regenerate, we increase the rate. If you have, low, uh, the regenerate is, not, is poor, we decrease the rate of distraction. If it is very poor, sometimes you do compression, then distraction many times. The third one is consolidation phase. After we reach the target, our target, we wait for the consolidation phase where the bone takes the normal shape of the bone. So we have three stages of the biology of bone lengthening, latency phase, distraction phase, and consolidation phase. There are many methods are the develop or developing nowadays to stimulate the regenerate regeneration area, whether we have systemic or local. Systemic like bisphosphonates, local like bone morphogenic protein, platelet-rich plasma, still under trials. 
Because the dream of all orthopedic surgeons that we finish or all the patients that we finish lengthening in a very short time. We know that lengthening takes about one, one centimeter takes about one month. We want to decrease it, so still under trial, many methods are used. The evolution of bone lengthening device. Every day we have a new device for bone lengthening. The merit of the device is all well known, but they, they all use the same biologic law, or the law of tension stress. Started with the skeletal traction. The unilateral fixator was the standard fixator for such a long, long time. Then Elizarov circular fixator using Elizarov method. Then computer assisted external fixators, TSF or Taylor Special Frame, hexapoda, SUV. Then internal bone lengthening the nails, which, make, which made the difference. Because some people, they don't like to have an external fixation or something outside the skin. The Albizia nail, ISKD, fit bone, and recently also precise. Also been using many techniques. Lengthening the nailing. We do lengthening and after we finish the distraction, we put a nail. But there are dangers because of the deep infection. And we had it before. So we don't advise lengthening over nails. Lengthening over elastic nails had been used too in children. Lengthening over submuscular plate or locking plate. Again, it's fraught with the complication of infection or deep infection, especially in the Middle East with the hot weather. Or lengthening then plating afterwards. Finally, the internal lengthening devices. The mechanical like Albizia nail developed by Guichet and ISKD, then electrical fit bone developed by Baumgart, and finally magnetic or precise nail. The Albizia with rotation you can get lengthening, then ISKD with its complications, then it was withdrawn from the market. Finally, we had the fit bone with rate, rhythm, duration of distraction, controlled by radio frequency transmitter and implanted antenna. The indications for limb lengthening, it's, the indications are controversial. You have limb length discrepancy. If you have shortening of one limb due to trauma, congenital deformities, whatever it is, dwarfism, like a chondroplasia, you have lengthening on both sides, and cosmetic, you have lengthening on both sides. The indications of nails, because many people are asking for nails, you have to know that lower limb deficiency in adolescents and adults, which distances, which distance? Because usually with nails, we cannot lengthen for such a long distances, like 22 centimeters or 23 centimeters, usually between five and eight centimeters. The diameter of bone also it has to be not very thin because the smallest diameter of precise is 8.5 millimeter. We have to take care of the infection again. Maybe it's a remote complication, but if it happens, it's a real problem. And this is an example of unilateral lengthening because this is the case of fibular hemimelia or congenital absence of the fibula with the absence of the lateral trays of the foot, tibial shortening and angulation. Such a case, we do osteotomy or corticotomy in the apex and we do lengthening and we correct the deformity. Complications. <clears throat> Many people are frightened or scared because of the complications. I have a real problem because when I revised the literature, I found something which is quite interesting. People are publishing their complications, which is quite normal in the English literature. <clears throat> but when you see this table, <clears throat> Some people are doing 32 operations along three years, and there are multiple authors. Another is doing 73 year patients along 14 years. So each year, he was doing something like uh, five cases per year or something like this. 
So every two and a half months, he was doing one case. And they were reporting their results and the complications. What type of experience is this? Is this? If you compare it to the arthroplasty, when they speak about the arthroplasty, maybe they put a limit, 50 uh, arthroplasty surgeries per year for just a casual surgeon or something. How would you allow somebody who is doing two cases per year, so every six months, is doing one case, one case of bone lengthening, to give us his experience? It's very strange. And it was repeated in the literature. The second thing, you know, with external fixation and lengthening, you have many, many indications. We are doing trauma, we have many cases of trauma. We are doing non-union, we have many cases of non-union. We have cosmetic lengthening, hundreds of cases. We have congenital deformities, hundreds of cases. Osteotropatic deformities, pelvic support osteotomy, of the more than 140 cases. So how are the people are reporting their, that they are doing two cases per year? So what type of experience is this? We can consider most of the papers are speaking about casual limb lengthening surgeons. Casual limb lengthening surgeons. Anyhow, the most common complication is pin-track infection. We usually does not cause any problem. Poor regenerate formation, premature consolidation of the regenerate or axial malalignment. And I will give an example of this case of non-union. And we've done corticotomy and the compression, then lengthening. The first complication occur in this man. This man is 36 years old. He has premature consolidation of the nerves because of the very good new bone formation. So what we do for premature consolidation, we don't take the patient to the operating theater again. We continue the distraction. We continue the distraction till the power or the power of distraction overcome the lengthening area. So distraction starts back again. And this is malalignment. The patient is very big. And with this distraction for such a long distance, we have this deformity, various deformity. What we do? We change the distractor and the hinges. Gradually, one millimeter per day, till we see we corrected the deformity. Again, we don't take the patient to the operating theater again. Just we change the frame. Again, another problem, the common peroneal. If you do lengthening and tibial lengthening, you do. We've done thousands of cases of tibial lengthening. Sometimes you have a problem with the common peroneal nerve. How would you manage? We develop this, we start with this technique. When you put tibia fibular wire, when you do the tibia fibular wire, we push from the fibula to the tibia, then we push it more till we stop flush to the fibula. So if you come closer to the common peroneal nerve, we started to be away from the common peroneal nerve. Complications of mechanically driven nails. That's why we say, when you think about lengthening nails, wait and wait and wait. Because for the ice, ice KD, the people described it in the beginning as a miraculous thing. Then, after a few years, we have numerous complications. Runaway nails had been, and it was withdrawn from the markers after having numerous, numerous complications. Complications also of precise nail. This slide, I took this slide from uh, Professor Luigi Hamdi from Canada. And you have to know there is a word of caution. Not all complications are the same. Don't compare the pentrike infection to DB infection if you put a nail inside. Don't compare the discomfort from keeping the fixator for such a long time for deep infection. So you have to take care. If you want to put nail inside, whatever the type of nail, lengthening nail, length, nail after lengthening, plate after lengthening, you have to take care of the deep infection. Deep infection in such cases is a very serious complication. Physiotherapy. Physiotherapy is very important. Many times you allow the patient, we teach the patient to go to walk, to go to uh, 
to have swimming, to work, to do everything in a normal manner. Hospital stay, it's only one day or daycare operation. The patient usually, we let the patient out at the hospital in the same day of the bone lengthening or the day after, because we minimize the costs. We want to do bone lengthening for everybody. It's not an expensive operation like the people describe in the West. We don't think so. And because we do many cases, we don't think the patient has to pay all that amount of money. We don't think so. So we do as much as we can to minimize the costs. Now we are going to speak about some indications, achondroplasia. There are cultural, cultural differences. Why we have many people of achondroplasia have lentering, but not in the West, not in Germany, because we have a rare problem. We don't have facilities for the short people. That's why all of them, they seek lengthening. At which age? Now we developed from our experience that we're transverse lengthening. We, tra we start the first lengthening for the tibia at the age five or six, six centimeters. And also we tighten the lateral ligament. We correct the deformity, we do lengthening five, six meters, and we raise the tibula above the fibula because the fibula is high. So we tension the lateral ligament. Then we do femoral lengthening at the age 9 to 11 centimeters. Uh, 9 to 11 years. For 9 to 12 centimeters. Then we do second tibial lengthening, usually by focal, for 11 to 13 years. The final one is humeral lengthening at age 15 to 16, usually between 8 to 10 centimeters. Why we do humeral lengthening? Because we, have, we want to have proportionate shape of the patient. Why we finish at the age five, 15 to 16 years? Because most of the psychological problems, psychiatric problems, occur during, um, after high school when they go to the university, when they go to college. So we want the patient, we want the patient with achondroplasia to face the, um, the society with the new shape, with the new length. So the people will not say, this guy was short, then he had operations of length. No, no, no. He will face the society by his, his 160 centimeter tall. He's a tall patient, normal patient, proportionate patients. So the self-esteem will be that good so he can work, he can move in the society, in a normal way. And this is an example. This patient presented to us at this age, 18 years old, we did lengthening of the tibia for 17 centimeter. You see how the patient walking and the frame on both sides in the swimming pool. Then femoral lengthening for 13 centimeters on both sides. You see femoral and tibia lengthening then humeral lengthening for 10 centimeters to have proportionate uh, dimensions of the upper and lower limbs. You see how he, the patient is working on the computer. And this is showing you the steps of such patients. It's very important also for the hygiene to have normal length for arms. Old age. This patient presented to us at age 53. We don't have age limit. This is very important issue. We don't have an age limit. Because some people think that length lengthening for young people and for old people, it's not possible. This is not true. This patient came to us at age 53 years with achondroplasia, with knee, a severe knee and ankle deformities and started to have pain. So we decided to correct it by bifocal corticotomy. You see, we did corticotomy of the upper part and corticotomy of the lower part. We corrected the deformity, we tightened the lateral ligament and we had some lengthening, as you see here, with gradual distraction at the age 53. So there is always hope for older people if you want to have lengthening, 
we don't have a problem with the older people. Lengthening is not only for children. This is not true. Lengthening, limb lengthening for all ages. And you see after fixator removal. Cosmetic lengthening. Cosmetic lengthening is a very important topic. And we believe that everybody has the right to have the normal shape in his point of view. So we lengthen some people who are not really short. We lengthen 180 centimeter guy for special reason. If you are convinced, but you have to know that reality has to be closer to the expectations. You have to take care of this during discussion with the patient. Also in cosmetic lengthening, psychiatric evaluation is mandatory for the patients to exclude body dysmorphic disorder. This is very important to have psychiatric help before giving the patient this chance to have cosmetic lengthening. We almost lengthen 35 to 40% of the people coming to me for cosmetic lengthening. And this is an example by, for cosmetic tibia lengthening on both sides for 11 centimeters, as you see. And this is gradual lengthening. And this is the end picture with normal bone formation and normal function. Upper extremity lengthening. The reason upper extremity operations are not attempted as often as lower extremity operations might be due to reports of high rates of complications and the possibility of functional deterioration. Why the upper extremity lengthening is not that widespread? Because there was a bad reputation before. The bad reputation was based upon nothing. People were thinking that the upper, if you do upper extremity lengthening, the function will be less. This is not true. The second thing, many of the people who did upper extremity lengthening had no very little experience. They were doing one patient per year or something. So how they, are, they were going to have an experience if they have very limited number of patients. And look to the papers when they speak about the lengthening, they spoke about very small number of patients. What are the indications for upper extremity lengthening? Achondroplasia, hereditary multiple exostosis, physial growth arrest, amputation. Some people had amputation, whether congenital or traumatic. Infection with septic epiphysitis. Shortening from trauma, also trauma can cause shortening. And this is an example of 12 years old boy with 10 centimeter post-traumatic humeral sh shortening. You see to the shoulder, People were afraid to do bone lengthening of the humerus because they thought if you do lengthening of the humerus, you are going to have shoulder dislocation. This is not true. We didn't see any case of shoulder dislocation in our experience. You see, we did gradual lengthening at the end of distraction, and you see normal shoulder, there is no problem at all. Again, radial club hand. People think that the maximum length you can do is 20% based on the, an experimental study. This is not true. We lengthened this patient, the forearm of this patient, 115% of the original length, and you see. Phalangeal lengthening. Phalangeal lengthening is a very important topic. You see in such a patient with congenital deformities, we lengthen two uh, metacarbals at the same time using two small external fixators. Again, this is uh, an amputated stump. We lengthened the amputated stump, as you see here. And this is post-traumatic loss of half of the metacar metatar metacarbal. And we lengthened, as you see, the metacarbal for such a long distance. The magnitude of lengthening, the age of lengthening. There is no age of lengthening. We lengthen the patient at any age. Again, I want to repeat it. Do we have a limit? Do we have a limit? Like the people say in the West, 20%. This is not true. This is not true. This rule comes from doing very small number of cases 
died by many surgeons in many centers. So we don't have this limit. Look to the case of tibial hemimelia or congenital absent tibial type 2. In such a case, the first operation was to move the tibia above the fibula, and we did that. Then we did fusion of the lower tibia to the femur. Then we did corticotomy and lengthening, and we had this lengthening. Then we had another lengthening, like you see here, for such a long, long distance, about 12 centimeters. See here, for tibial hemelia. And the function is okay. And you see after such a long, before skeletal maturity is almost the same length. And in the fifth operation, we corrected the valgus deformity, as you see here. Humoral lengthening. The basics was you don't have to lengthen the humerus for such a long time, otherwise you are going to have shoulder dislocation, like this patient, these patients. But you see here, in such a patient we started, this was long, long time ago, we have shortening, we have severe shortening, 15 centimeters, we did lengthening for 4 centimeters. But the patient continued, continued. We have such a long, long distance. The family decided to continue. And you see, we have about 110% lengthening of him. Nothing happened to the shoulder. And so afterwards, my decision was to lengthen the humerus for such any distance. Like such a case, 11 centimeter lengthening of the humerus. So we don't have this restriction. Again, the magnitude of lengthening. Do we have a limit? I will show another example. This is an amputated crushed foot, which had been treated in the Coptic hostel in Kenya by replantation. To have a successful replantation, they removed part of the bone, very long segment. The replantation succeeded, and you had non-union, deformity, and 22 centimeter shortening for replantation. So we did, this is showing you the shortening, how far shortening it is, and the deformity. We did corticotomy, and the brightment of the lower part, and compression lower down, and then gradual lengthening, gradual lengthening, 10 centimeter, 15 centimeter, 22 centimeters. So we had limb length discrepancy 22 centimeters. You see, this rule is not valid. We can lengthen the distance we want, as you see in such a patient with very good regenerate formation. The patient is 28 years ago, he is not a child. Again, bone lengthening is not only for children, bone lengthening for any age you want. One important point for them lengthening, the experience. And the role of surgeon volume on patient outcome. The problem which I have been facing now with many patients, that when they read, when they go through the internet, they find papers with certain names. And they think because they publish papers that you have a real experience. This is not true. Animation is not experience. So many people, they show you just animations, just animations. Where are the patients? People are showing you, showing you cosmetic lengthening. What's cosmetic lengthening? You have a normal leg and you move just like this. Where are the real cases? If you want to do lengthening, you have to find a surgeon with a real experience, with a real volume of surgeries. What's the value? What's the volume? The volume is 300 per year, 500 per year, not five cases per year. Sometimes we do maybe five or seven cases per day. Where is the problem lies? Where is the problem? The problem lies in the indications. If you look to such indications in the Western world, it's very limited indications. 
Why the indications are widespread in Egypt or in the Middle East? Because one third of the population is under age 15. Many of them have congenital deformities with high instance because of the consanguineous marriage. Consanguineous marriage in some countries is about more than 50% of marriages. High instance of neglected trauma. In the, next, in the next 20 years, the number of neglected tra trauma in the tropical and subtropical area or the low-income countries is far more than high-income countries. Conflicts. This is, we have a large number of patients coming from the conflict zones and they have shortening and they need lengthening. That's why we have many, many cases for limb lengthening in this area. And in the West, they have very small number of cases because of these four factors in such a slide. One third of the population is under the age 15. Some countries in Europe, the number of children is getting smaller and smaller, most of the cases. We have high incidence of negative trauma, high incidence of congenital deformities and conflicts. And we have to think also about experience in which field. Many surgeons are to cosmetic lengthening. No more, no more. And they did advisement, advertisement because they do cosmetic lengthening. Cosmetic lengthening, this is the end of the bone lengthening surgeon or limb lengthening surgeon. He has to do thousands of cases before, before going to do cosmetic lengthening. Unfortunately, it's the opposite. If you look to the advertisement, right, just limb lengthening, you'll find all paid advertisement of centers everywhere doing cosmetic lengthening. Do you call it experience? Do you call cosmetic lengthening only experience? Do you call animation and advertisement experience? And as you see again, look to the complication. Look to the, this review of the papers. And I want, I want you to read carefully the number of patients, the period of the study, and how far the experience of each surgeon. Is the surgeon doing 0.2 patient per year or 0.5 patient per year? Look to their experience in pelvic support osteopathy. The authors speak about eight cases done in five centers by 20. Doctors along five years period. So each one of them have, has an experience 0.1 patient per year. In conclusion, Limb lengthening is a rapidly developing field of orthopedic surgery. Currently, it's a standard procedure with predictable results and the indications have been, ex have been extended to include upper extremities and cosmetic lengthening too. I think experience has a great impact on the results of different procedures because follow-up and management of expected complications are cornerstones of treatment strategies. It's very important for the follow-up. It's very, very strange to find people doing to, to have an operation and go back home after one week. This is very funny. Experience in the follow-up is far more important than experience in the operations. Even if you do just a nail. So what, what's, what's the experience in putting an interlocking nail for an orthopedic surgeon? Nothing. Unfortunately, the English literature has many papers with relatively small number of patients operated on by many surgeons over a long period. They had no chance to have real experience. They wrote papers, they wrote many papers, but actually they didn't have the chance to have a real experience in limb lengthening. This means that the experience of the individual surgeon is based on only one or few cases per year. Can you imagine the experience of one or few cases per year? And when you write it on the internet, you will find his name many times. Sometimes it's difficult to get valid conclusions from the reported mixed data. In spite of the introduction of the promising intramedullary lengthening nails and computer assisted external fixation, we still count on Elizar of biologic laws. Advances through research to simulate regeneration and reduce the period of treatment 
will be the rare revolution in limb lengthening surgery. Well, biologic solutions are the real advances. We are waiting for more research in the biologic solutions. So to shorten the period of lengthening, limb lengthening surgery. Again, if you want to see my opinions after 37 years of experience, after doing thousands of patients of limb lengthening in different aspects, cosmetic lengthening, achondroplasia, post-traumatic, fractures, non-union, fibrillar hemilia, tibial hemilia, you can find this in your paper, my paper in the journal Orthopedic and Traumatology, which is an open access. Please read it and you can find a lot of important facts of limb lengthening. Thank you.